All right, today I'm going to talk about rewilding. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today I got from reviewing this book. It's a really, really good book. If you are interested in this topic and you want to read more about it, they pretty much cover all of the examples globally of rewilding up to the point it was published, which is pretty cool, really valuable, really lays out the groundwork for what rewilding is about, what it means, how it, uh, how it's being done around the world, success stories, failures, all sorts of things like that. So really good book to take a look at if you're, if you're interested. For me, this is one of those topics that's super exciting because th there are a couple of things. One, it's implicit to the idea of rewilding, right? We're basically talking about restoring uh, ecosystems to some previous function by either uh, putting animals in it or uh, allowing things to colonize. We'll talk about different types later on in this lecture, but uh, there, the implicit assumption that gets me really excited is that wildlife are an important part of the way the ecosystem functions. And when you don't have those wildlife in those ecosystems, it, the function starts to uh, change over time. So for some reason, for me, that's always been really exciting, the idea that, man, just having this, this squirrel species or this herbivore or this predator in the system is making the entire system function differently. And that, that uh, is just an exciting thing to think about. So uh, the original version, when it was coined, the term rewilding is actually right here. Uh, Sule and Noss were the first authors that, that uh, really coined that term, and it was defined as a conservation method based on cores, corridors, and carnivores, okay? So when they were talking about it, they were talking about uh, Florida and thinking about panther habitat and trying to increase connectivity. So in other words, rewilding landscapes to increase that, the, uh, the, corridors between core areas and they were specifically talking about how important that was for carnivores. Uh, if you're interested in some of these papers I'm happy to provide you links to them or if you uh, just search rewilding in Sule and Nos, uh, you'll find it pretty easily so if you're interested in that. That, that was the original way that people were thinking about it and it kind of started taking off and and people start to think more broadly about it. And it's basically just thinking about ways that we can restore the function of an ecosystem. And that might be through the reintroduction of a species, could be any taxa of species, or it could just be allowing uh, things to nature essentially to take back over. So this has been posed by several authors, including in that book, that, as a potentially cost-effective way to reinstate how vegetation communities should succeed, to uh, reinitiate top-down trophic interactions, so like herbivory affecting uh, how plants succeed or predators affecting how plants succeed indirectly by changing how herbivores uh, function in the system. All of these things are really aimed at trying to increase ecosystem services within the ecosystem. So I'll use that as a segue. There's another paper that I cite in this uh, presentation several times and it has really good examples. There, uh, this, that paper is also available in the module. Please go and read that because they really describe to you what an ecosystem service is and uh, provided a really unique way of measuring the success of rewilding. So uh, basically all of the research up to this point has had these, these major themes where we're trying to resume wildness. Okay, so think about what is, what is a wilderness? All right, do you know what that actually is? You probably ought to uh, go Google search that and see what you come up with. But essentially a, wild, a wilderness is a wild area without the influence of man. So at that most general definition, you know, it, it's hard to think of a place that would actually fit that criteria. Uh, there have been other more um, direct um, 
ways to define it. Uh, you think about having a, a large natural area where, where basically it's not bisected by a road, right? There aren't that many places of, of that anymore. In fact, I think I was hiking one time in the farthest place from a road in the U.S. and it was still not it was not but a several miles. I can't remember how far it was now, but uh, it wasn't that far in the grand scheme of things, which is uh, kind of sad to think about in some ways. But yeah, so while you, you have the general idea of what wilderness is, go look that up because that makes a big, big difference from a regulatory standpoint, which I think we talked about a little bit in the class beforehand, but it's essentially a, an area that uh, is not being influenced or, or the, the influence of man is, is minimal. So that's one of the main themes in, the, in, the, uh, in this rewilding era of, of, uh, of uh, research, but also uh, the focus has kind of shifted now to reintroducing extirpated species. That in and of itself is not really that controversial generally, although it can be like the, the uh, wolves to Yellowstone, for instance, we, have, we still have wolves on the planet. We can still reintroduce those species that have been extir extirpated from an area. But in other cases, uh, many cases, when we're trying to use a substitute, that becomes much more controversial. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit on into the presentation. But what we're talking about with a substitute is essentially some functionally similar species is still on the planet we reintroduce that to an area to fill the functional role of something that, uh, you know, a species that has gone extinct, okay? So that's what we're talking about with a substitute. Also, another main theme is, you know, the drive behind all of this, the objective is to create a self-sustaining functional ecosystem that delivers ecosystem services uh, that are important to humans ultimately. <clears throat> so, uh, here's one of the definitions of the wild, and Sule and Noss basically are talking about large, strictly protected core reserves with high connectivity and keystone species are intact in the system. So, basically, those keystone species are really important because they have disproportionately large effects on other species and in the ecosystem. So when you take that species, like beavers for instance, if you take that species out of the ecosystem, it degrades the function of the entire system and it has a really large, disproportionately large effect on the system. We talked about another one, the Key Largo wood rat is a, would probably fit this keystone species. Both of those examples are, are also ecosystem engineers. So make sure you have those things straight because it'll probably show up in questions. A keystone species does not have to be an ecological engineer, okay, or an ecosystem engineer. They do not have to be the same thing, but most of the time ecological engineers, species that are constructing some substrate or, or changing the substrate or structure of the ecosystem in ways that disproportionately affect other species are often keystone species, okay? So ecological engineers or ecosystem engineers, those are interchangeable. Those often are keystone species, but they don't have to be. And keystone species don't have to be ecosystem engineers. So make sure you have that straight. But in either case, they're both really important to the function of the system. And the definition of a keystone species is just that. They have a disproportionately large effect on the, the ecosystem and its function. So this approach, this rewilding approach is, is getting a lot of traction. So we talked a little bit about Pleistocene Park. I'm gonna put a link in here so you can go and see that. The Zemovs established this. And uh, if you're interested in these, just pause it right here and you can read these different ones. I'm not gonna go into detail in all of them, but I, the main thing is I wanted to show you that this approach is being pretty widely used across the planet. Like you can see them. Uh, all over the place right here. A lot of really cool projects ongoing. So 
particularly in Europe, they have embraced this idea and they have lots of different kinds of rewilding. But just look at when we zoom into this small area, there are a ton of initiatives with rewilding going on. If you compare that to the United States, I mean, they're, they're not even on the same order of magnitude in terms of the efforts to do this kind of stuff. And uh, part of that is probably because they are marketing it as rewilding there. So when you do literature searches and stuff, you find those, but also uh, there, there tends to be a, a stronger buy-in uh, in, in systems there from the people than they're doing in the United States. And that could be for a lot of reasons. One, uh, from a cultural standpoint, uh, that's probably driving some of that, but also, uh, you know, people have been in Europe, the, the uh, Europeans have been there for long enough that a lot of the wildlife species and, and ecosystems have, have been uh, degraded to a much greater, or at least for a longer time period than other parts of the world. And so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, again, pause it right here and read some of these. And these papers are really easy to find if you're interested in any particular one of these. Uh, you can pretty, pretty well find it really easily by just Google searching it on, on Scholar. So to look at sort of a cross section of the history of this, it kind of started with monumentalism. And what I mean by that is basically we were thinking about having these huge wild areas and it was just to, to keep a wild area so that we could point to it like Yellowstone, right? We, like we commonly point to that as the, the uh, you know, this great accomplish of humanity to protect the wilderness. And, uh, you know, this is our monument to that success and protecting nature and these, you know, producing this huge, vast area that is still uh, functioning as a wilderness. That kind of evolved into the wilderness society and that led to uh, many uh, conservationists and activists that are kind of pushing that mission. And if you kind of fast forward along, we started uh, basically moving into this era of biological conservation where ecologists really got interested in and uh, looking at ecosystems and how they function, classifying those systems and recognizing that the way that those systems function and the way they perpetuate through time is through uh, the importance of disturbance, okay? And really at that time we started recognizing not only that abiotic disturbances like fire and wind and those sorts of things were critical to the way these systems evolved and function but also that animals were really important for the way that they function so pretty interesting times to to think about this sort of stuff and uh, starting to recognize and characterize these systems in this way then we talked about uh, island biogeography that, of course, uh, came earlier, right? The fundamentals of island biogeography and those fundamental experiments that we talked about in that, in the island biogeography theory lectures, uh, those were pretty integral to some of the concepts that we took off with in conservation biology. So we have these isolated populations that we're trying to conserve really often, and we took uh, the idea of island biogeography to a new level where we're starting to try to apply those concepts to conservation, to uh, these efforts to reestablish species. And that led, you know, those efforts over a couple of decades kind of led us down this path to where rewilding became a big thing. And, and uh, some of the initial approaches, again, with rewilding were essentially taking island biogeography and operationalizing that, right? We were taking these core areas and trying to connect them in ways that made sense from an island biogeography theory standpoint to reconnect populations and make make uh, some of these populations more viable. And that naturally led down the path even further where we started thinking about rewilding even from a re, uh, reintroducing species concept. So that kind of leads me into some different categories of rewilding. It, when I first started reading about this, it was really interesting because I guess I didn't even realize that there were categories. I was just thinking, I mean, for me, it was just like, oh, 
we don't have a giant herbivore anymore. We're going to put giant herbivores back in it. You know, that, that's kind of how I was thinking about it. But after doing this research on the topic for the lectures for you all, uh, it got really interesting to me. So one of them that I was familiar with is called Pleistocene rewilding. And this is basically exactly what it sounds like. The idea here is that during the Pleistocene era, there was a period of really high diversity of, of fauna, particularly megafauna, and that diversity uh, from a global standpoint had stabilizing factors on the way the ecosystems were functioning, but more importantly, how the climate was functioning. And the idea with Pleistocene rewilding is that we can find uh, close surrogates in most case of extinct species and then restock those. So I think it's the next slide I have a link to Pleistocene Park where you can go and watch a video uh, about their rewilding efforts. But this map right here is kind of a, a, one of the telling maps to me. If you just kind of look at some of the targets of rewilding. So we have mega herbivores, uh, medium sized herbivores, also uh, large dogs and cats. When we look at it globally, especially for the, the mega herbivores in some places in, in the world, I mean, the, the fauna have been impaired dramatically since the Pleistocene era. And that, that's the idea with this is that we could take some of those few species that are surrogates and put them back into those systems and resume some of those those uh, ecosystem functions that provide really important ecological services for us. So here's the link. Uh, I'm gonna post the, the uh, PowerPoint in here so you can go to the PowerPoint and click on this link and hopefully that'll work for you if, you're, if you wanna go watch the video. Uh, I may ask questions out of these videos so make sure that you uh, take a look at them if you wanna know those questions uh, for the quizzes and the exam. So the, just to kind of quickly go over what Pleistocene Park was about, uh, I think we've talked about this a little bit, but the basic idea of Pleistocene Park is that mega herbivores had a really important function on the planet in regulating climate. And that one of those ways that they did that was by, by uh, preserving carbon in permafrost. And the way that they did that is simple, essentially, if you imagine being in the, uh, the Pleistocene steppe, which was basically a big grassland, you get a lot of snow on that system during the winter. And these herbivores obviously are trying to eat grass that's underneath the snow. So basically what, what happened in the system, or what was thought is, is the herbivore herbivores were constantly digging through the snow and packing it down and reducing the amount of snow on the ground. And because snow is a really good insulator, when you take the herbivore out, that snow starts to build up. And when the snow builds up, it actually decreases or increases the temperature at the soil surface, right? Ice is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but it commonly will be in the negative 50 or negative 100 even in some cases outside right with that ambient temperature so the ice is a the uh, snow is essentially buffering the soil from those extreme cold temperatures and because of that the permafrost does not uh, extend as far into the soil and then also the snow uh, when it melts in the summer there's not as much permafrost to melt so the herbivores, by, by continually removing the snow, allowed that permafrost to get colder and set deeper, which ultimately preserved more carbon in the soil. And because, uh, you know, th th most of our carbon uh, or a lot of our carbon is bound up in permafrost, when that starts to thaw, it starts to produce a lot of carbon that was formerly out of the cycle, but now it's in the cycle and it feeds into climate and accelerates warming. And that's, that's the whole idea behind it, essentially. They'll talk about it in more detail and I'm happy to discuss this in, in uh, this discussions if you're interested, but really cool idea that these mega herbivores really had a stabilizing effect on the climate 
through this process of foraging that ultimately led to large amounts of carbon being sequestered in, in uh, this permafrost. So another category of rewilding is called trophic rewilding. And basically what we're talking about here is reintroducing a species. It's really commonly a megafaunal species, but also uh, it could be a, a predator in some cases, but we typically are thinking about reinstalling that herbivory. Uh, so when we were talking about the herbivores affecting the snow, if we were putting back species that were still on the planet instead of surrogates, and we were just restoring those species back to places they already were, that would better fit in trophic rewilding. Okay, but it, uh, you know, Pleistocene rewilding is specifically trying to fill the functional roles of species that were lost during that Pleistocene era. So there are a couple of things, uh, obviously you can read this, but there are a couple of tenants that that are basically, so in other words, they're, uh, they're basically uh, assumptions that are being made that assume uh, those assumptions are needed to, to, to basically have trophic rewilding be successful. Basically, the, one of them is megafauna are important to the way the ecosystem's structured and functions, right? So that's what I was talking about originally in the first slide is uh, that's implicit to these approaches that megafauna are important. Another thing is that having a rich megafauna was pretty typical worldwide. And I just showed you on the previous slide, there were parts of the world that had many megafaunal species, right? So that's implicit to this, that, uh, that on an evolutionary time scale, that is typical. And also, uh, implicit an implicit assumption in this approach is that the loss of that megafauna led to the loss of biodiversity or the way the ecosystem functions and therefore uh, you know trophic rewilding or in other words adding those megafauna back will resume those functions or uh, improve biodiversity. Uh, this was a pretty cool uh, figure that I found right here where it was kind of showing you how diverse through uh, this evolutionary time we get to the late Pleistocene era basically human influence starts picking up right here and you can see uh, that's what this red means right here and you can see immediately we start seeing reductions in the diversity globally uh, especially we get into where we're now calling it the Anthropocene the, the new epic uh, you can see uh, we, we've degraded the diversity of megafauna on the planet quite a bit. And this is where uh, things start to, you know, we're, we're starting to recognize that right here at this line. And now the idea is that we can use the species that are still present to reestablish a lot of that uh, diversity and that ecological function that, that was being driven by species in these systems. So, one of the things, one of the reasons there's so many, uh, so many of these efforts going on in Europe is because, uh, first of all, there's a lot of, of buy-in, but also they're, they're engaging a lot in what they're calling passive rewilding. So this is another category of rewilding. And basically what's happening here is, is uh, in Europe, there are all these, these agricultural landscapes that are basically being abandoned, okay? So in Europe, you have this, these, these uh, farmsteads that have been there for, for a long time and they, they have now been abandoned and they're just being allowed to go back to normal, right? Obviously, they can't go back to normal in some contexts, like if species have, been, have gone extinct or don't have access to recolonize, uh, that's problematic for this, but in general, uh, vegetation communities start to recolonize these, and you do start to get some semblance of, an, of the ecosystem as it was. So basically, the idea is that with passive rewilding, you can just go hands off and let things colonize and uh, resume dominance or regain dominance. So uh, there's some 
you know, there are lots of reasons why we do this in some places and don't in others. And uh, again, you can pause that here and kind of look through some of these different things, but uh, there are a lot of challenges that we have to look at uh, that, that, that make it really difficult, I guess. One is what is the role of humans in, in the rewilded landscape? I mean, when we're allowing a landscape to resume wilderness, are we trying to completely eliminate human influence? Is that even possible? to do? Where, where do we draw the line? Uh, you can imagine how difficult that might be. Another thing that uh, the paper that I have, have you read, read in, uh, this week was about monitoring and assessment of success. And they came up with a really good model to do that. But that's something that, that we failed to do in a lot of these efforts. When you do reestablish species, did it work? How do you know it works? What are, where is the cutoff where it did work versus didn't? You know, those sorts of things are, are really uh, difficult for us to define. And that makes it hard to get by in. It makes it hard to, de to uh, decide how much it's gonna cost. When do you stop? When is it functioning? Uh, you know, there, there's also some issues that have arisen where we've created a novel ecosystem, right? That novel food web, and it actually uh, creates a, a, a lot of problems, right? So putting wolves back into Yellowstone created a lot of human wildlife conflicts with wolves and the surrounding landowners, for instance. So there are lots of things like that to think about uh, when we're doing this, this type of thing. The other problem is we you know, we have to think about the geological context. And uh, that's what some of this is kind of trying to show is, is uh, you know, if we look across an urban to wilderness gradient, there's uh, this obvious uh, gradient and habitat fragmentation, and also the scale at which the rewilding initiative can occur are kind of opposing forces, right? So we should probably shape our conservation goals around those limitations that are already in place, right? We're obviously not going to rewild an enormous area that is an urban area, you know, in comparison to what we might be able to do in, uh, you know, reestablishing wilderness areas, for instance, uh, if we have large tracks of, of uh, abandoned agricultural land. <clears throat> so if we're thinking about the level of intervention or how much, how, how much are we going to have to invest into this activity for it to be successful, but also how uncertain is the outcome? We're kind of looking at, at a gradient here for this restoration book. Uh, baseline. So if we're trying to reestablish functioning in the Pleistocene where we don't even have those species left, we're going to have to put in ecological replacements pretty much completely. And we might have to put in a whole food web worth of ecological replacements in that. That, that is a, an extremely active approach where we're putting a ton of effort in it. And there's also a huge amount of ecological uncertainty in that system in terms of how it's going to function. So on the opposite end of that, that the passive role, think about what we were talking about when we're letting things recolonize. All we're doing is providing an opportunity for species that are already present and that have access to that area. We're just backing away and allowing those to recolonize. So comparatively, there's a lot more certainty that that's going to happen. If you abandon an agricultural field, we're going to have plants colonize that and then animals colonize that as well. We know that, but it's not gonna be something that's extinct, right? So uh, it's also not gonna be something that, that uh, doesn't have access to colonize it. So we may have to you know, immediately increase the level of intervention if we're in a context where it's isolated from populations that can colonize. <clears throat> so uh, I know this is, is kind of confusing. And again, this is the paper I'm talking about that I put in the module for you to go and read. And they, they go into detail in some of these things. But essentially, 
uh, there are three things that these authors have, have deemed very important to the success of uh, some of these programs. One, if we have, you know, think about the, the dots as being the trophic complexity. So how many species are involved in, in uh, this service? You think about these lines as dispersal. So when they're solid lines like this, those two species can disperse really well between them but uh, the dotted line means that they may be able to get there, but not, uh, it's not a very conducive way, or they may not be able to because of this road, but would be able to otherwise. And then when we're thinking about recovery from disturbance in the system, so you have something that disturbs the community, how quickly does it respond to that and recover from it? Right, so the, the more intact the system and more complex, the better it recovers. So you see this community doesn't recover very well. <clears throat> However, one approach that we might have for the road situation that we actually use on the planet is to have overpasses or underpasses is what we do in Florida, but overpasses are more common in other places where we've actually tried to increase the connectivity between that. And you can see with more diverse uh, assemblages here and we increase that dispersal, basically those communities uh, can respond to disturbance much quicker and resume that function. So uh, again, they talk about this in more detail in the paper. I don't want to go on all day in this lecture, so uh, I didn't want to go in too much detail, but hopefully you get an idea of what we're talking about. You know, when, when disturbances happen, we shift the system away from some state. When the system is more ecologically or trophically complex and there's better dispersal between populations, those systems then recover back to that stable state more quickly and they're more resilient to that disturbance in general. So, there, uh, here's basically how the authors set up uh, looking at these different systems. So if we have, the, you think of the red right here as being an ecological state before we implemented a rewilding. And uh, the yellow is how the system changed once we did rewild it. So the, this first case, case study was basically uh, re-establishing the hydrology of a system. And uh, basically, we, you know, exactly what you might expect. We saw an increase in species richness of flood tolerant species. And that probably, I don't think they measured it necessarily in this one, but it probably increased the uh, number of, of wildlife taxa that were associated with it as well. But they, they characterized it into three types of ecosystem services. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about with ecosystem services, they talk about it in this paper uh, to great lengths, but you can also uh, look that up really easily. There are several types of ecosystem services, but they kind of boiled it down to three types. One would be a non-material, so uh, services that the ecosystem are providing that aren't necessarily directly impacting humans. So that'd be, that's why they're calling it non-material. And it's not necessarily a regulating service either, which I'll get to in just a second. So the non-material would be something like increasing the diversity of the system or strengthening ecological inter interactions, uh, increasing trophic complexity, those sorts of things would be those non-material ecosystem services. Remember, uh, biodiversity is in the interest of humans. It's in the interest of everybody, but that would be a non-material because it doesn't have direct links uh, necessarily to, to monetary things. A regulating service would be things like pollination or seed dispersal or things, uh, nutrient cycling, those things that the ecosystem is helping regulate. So uh, they have a direct uh, impact on water cycles and nutrient cycles, pollinating, all those sorts of things are really important to the way the systems function and what we get out of it as humans. Material is a little more tangible where, you know, if we removed land out of agriculture to restore it, like that would have a negative material or there'd be a loss, right? Because we lost that agricultural production. Uh, 
an increase in material that might happen is like if we establish a park and then uh, people are willing to pay to come experience nature, right? So those would be the kinds of things we're talking about with that. So again, you can read uh, some of these things that happen on this and they talk about it in, in that study as well. So here, a little higher level of intervention here where we've uh, basically on this one, we just reestablished the hydrology. On this one, there was actually a hunting ban and there were some reintroductions in this system. And uh, you can see that it had a pretty big impact, particularly on the trophic complexity here, right? So it didn't really change how disturbances were happening. It didn't change that much dispersal wise because they didn't really change the landscape configuration, but they did increase the trophic complexity, which uh, is a way to measure the value of that rewilding program. You can see it had big benefits on uh, these three categories, but it also had some negative effects on regulating and material. And uh, I think that uh, some of the carbon sequestration, if I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, was one thing, but you can see right here, the agricultural abandonment that, that happened as a result is a negative material. That's what's making up that, that right there. But the positive ones, again, the, the uh, park was providing uh, opportunities for experiencing nature and, and uh, creating habitat and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so here's another case study. And this one was uh, basically reintroducing mammals in this park. And the idea behind it was to increase trophic complexity in the system and reinstall some of these ecological interactions. You can see uh, you know, that had a pretty big impact, particularly on trophic complexity, but it also had a pretty large effect on dispersal and uh, disturbances in the system and resulted in a net gain in all of these uh, ecosystem services. So pretty cool. Uh, these, these projects are pretty easy to find too if you wanna read more about them online and Perino and it all go into it in pretty a good detail, but I just wanted to give you some different examples of how we might uh, rewild a system. So here's another one. This one uh, had land abandonment, so passive, uh, passive and active with reintroductions. And the idea was uh, to recover the large mammal community in Chernobyl. And you can see this actually had a huge effect on on those on that system's function and really strong ecosystem services as a result. So I want to give you some uh, examples that are closer to home. Of course, this is the United States right here. This is uh, called the Y2Y famously, but it's basically trying to establish a corridor between the Yukon and Yellowstone. Not sure if you all uh, found this when you were talking about uh, the corridor projects the other day in discussion, but a pretty cool example and uh, it's been pretty successful. So this was in 1993 and a couple of decades later, you can see how much more. So the, the white is what they were, you know, the plan was the objective. And you can see the yellow is the progress that we've made with protecting land. Now, not all of this land is necessarily public but it is in some sort of, of easement or something that uh, gives us some level of certainty that it will be protected for a long time period. So here's showing you uh, the, the uh, southern part of that in the United States. You can see we've made a lot of progress over in the Midwest. I was up here in Montana uh, in that area right there not long ago. So that's pretty cool. But uh, you can see up in the northern ranges, we've got some big uh, things established, but uh, a lot of open space in there, a lot of room for improvement. So something, uh, another way that we've done this, you know, roads have bisected lots of areas. I thought this was pretty cool because they literally are putting soil and establishing plant communities over the road in these things. It's pretty incredible to think about. I mean, you can see the trees literally going across that thing. It's pretty wild uh, to think about. But uh, this was a pretty cool example. <clears throat> 
uh, something that's probably more familiar to you is uh, we've we've used underpasses or tunnels to reestablish connectivity for for a lot of different species all over the planet. This is one example here. Uh, here's another pretty cool example in Europe where we're trying to reestablish wolves in these different locations, and you can see it's been pretty successful in a large portion of the range. <clears throat> So uh, we've gotten all the way up to 13,000. Yeah, now I, don't, I didn't put on there how many there were, but uh, there weren't nearly that, that many. And uh, you can see there are even some places where they're starting to colonize on their own. Uh, these lighter green right here, which is pretty cool. So a lot of these efforts, there, there are several things that have to go. One is, is uh, legal protection is necessary most of the time. I mean, a lot of these species are imperiled at least to some degree because of persecution by humans. So that's important. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, connectivity is also really important in these systems. So having the habitat connectivity so that they, they can respond to be reintroduced and the legal protection is really important, obviously. So, uh, yeah, here, here's some data just showing you in, in the German states uh, how the wolf population is is going. So pretty cool to, to see some of these efforts and uh, how quickly some of these these uh, these populations are taken off. This is a really cool video. Definitely encourage you to go check it out. But it's essentially telling you about the uh, quolls of, of uh, Australia and the reintroduction efforts and how successful they've been, what they're going through to do it. Uh, here's another video for you to go and check out on Tasmanian Devil. Uh, pretty cool story to look at. So if you're interested in this stuff, I highly recommend. Uh, the Tasmanian Devil is a kind of an interesting one also because it's really similar to what we're going to have a discussion on or uh, what excuse me, what uh, our next lecture is going to be on, which is, uh, you know, the, the Tasmanian devil declined precipitously, and we got all the way down to where only about 10% of the population was left, and there was a real problem with genetic bottleneck in the population, and uh, it kind of led to some, some issues. This is really similar to uh, what Brandon was talking about, or when you watch that that lecture with the issues that we were faced with with uh, with the Florida Panther. So uh, pretty cool. Definitely go and check out uh, that video. They talk about this at great lengths. I'm not going to spend any more time here since I'm already uh, going pretty long on this lecture. Uh, last, I thought it was really cool if we were thinking about Pleistocene rewilding to actually get a historical look at what kind of things uh, uh, we had here in Florida. So uh, I put a link right here for you to go and check out. And one of them, the one that I thought was really cool, I found this uh, thing right here where it was showing a giant beaver. Uh, I don't know why they used Justin Bieber. I guess that's the, because he's close to the average human size. But I thought that was pretty interesting to see, you know, a size comparison between the two is pretty crazy to think about. We used to have things like that running around right here where we're at. So go, ch go check out this video as well. It's a really cool, uh, really cool thing to watch. But all right. So I uh, look forward to talking to you all in the discussion. I hope you enjoyed this and it inspired you to go and, and uh, look up some of these efforts because I think this is one of the most exciting undertakings that we're taking as ecologists of, around the planet is these huge efforts to try to reestablish ecosystem level functions, which is pretty cool. Um, to think about. So happy to take questions on this and look forward to seeing you all in, in discussion.